Good evening, everybody. My name is Doyle Baxter. Um, I'm joined tonight by uh, Max Krieger, a good friend of mine. Uh, the two of us, we studied philosophy together at Xavier University in Cincinnati. Um, we had the great pleasure, you know, over the course of years, not really knowing each other, um, but working through the same intellectual tradition under the guidance of the same professors, um, you know, under the influence of the same, you know, eventual locality. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, at the, at the end of our time, uh, at, in our undergraduate education, we kind of discovered each other and we, 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 we noticed that we came from two very, very different backgrounds, two very different ways of uh, being in the world, two very different ways of reading the, the great, you know, the great books of Western education and Western, uh, Western, you know, provenance, I guess. Um, and, uh, well, anyway, um, I'll let him introduce himself here in just a second. But ultimately, I want to tell you the goal of this podcast, um, this conversation, and hopefully many conversations to come. You know, we we are both millennials, young adults, just graduated. We're both working jobs, and we're both not necessarily feeling uh, complete fulfillment in what we're doing. There's something that's lacking, and um, we believe wholeheartedly that um, by a return to um, the fertile soil from which we grew, um, we might learn something about ourselves and about the world. And by that, what I mean is the, um, are the great books of the Western tradition. And so the, the, the purpose of this, um, of these conversations are to just record our thoughts as we're working our way um, through the great books, starting with with Homer's Iliad. And uh, so I guess with, with some of those intro remarks, Max, um, go ahead and say hi. Hello, my name is Max. And uh, I think that was a wonderful introduction and covered all of the bases. So uh, I will leave your words there, but I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> Great. So, um, okay, so we're reading the Iliad. Um, we're more or less halfway through it. Um, books one through 12 are half of the of the books um of the 24 book iliad but not quite half of the the text of the iliad um so just for just for context i i studied in addition to philosophy at, at xavier i studied classics um and um i first read the iliad cover to cover as a sophomore and goodness, you know, it's, it's a book that as a classics major, you know, I had heard so much about and clearly knew it was, in, that it was important. And then I read the damn thing and, you know, it kind of knocked my socks off that in combination with Greek tragedy and the Aeneid, which are also books that Max and I are going to get to, but in a court, in one single course, you know, in the course of one semester, I was exposed to really the foundations of the Western intellectual tradition, um, both philosophically and um, literarily. And, you know, kind of the, I don't know, I kind of want to, do, do you think it would be helpful to like maybe summarize the books as we're, as we're going through them and then maybe zero in on important points or what do you think is the best way to proceed with this? Yeah, no, I think that that would be a good way. Although okay. your summarizing skills will probably out par mine. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is, okay. this has actually been my first read through since, freshman year in high school i think mm -hmm. Mine sophomore year and i hated it the first time i read it um with all the arrogance of a high schooler right right well, summarize that for me a little bit that's interesting um well i think the themes of the book are really hard for a high schooler to connect to mm. um there's so much epic phrasing in the book uh, stuff like, you know, he fell to the ground from which we all eat. Mm. Uh, mm. Or fate governs us all, you know, when they're talking about going into battle. And I think it's it's hard to connect with the realities of mortality. Um, having the historical empathic perspective where you're not bringing the 21st century to judge the text. Um, mm. you know, okay. Yeah. Why people fighting, he's being irrational, this guy's arrogant. A lot of that drops away. And yeah, I well, one of the things that strikes me about what just what you said, you know, I, I would argue that, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, the 
the the the theme if you can call it that the one of the central messages of the iliad is that human beings are gonna die Mm. i'm a human being therefore i'm gonna die and what am i gonna do about that you know and i think that achilles you know really achilles and hector are the i think they're the two i mean they're foils throughout most of the story um, and I think the Iliad in the the book written by Homer intentionally paints them as foils. But I think like just in the mythology, apart from Homer's rendition of it, they are two responses to the question of immortality, right? It's it's Achilles has the choice. He knows by a prophecy that he is going to die if he stays and fights at Troy. Yeah, but he knows, and then that's in book one, right? With his conversation with his mother Thetis, and yeah, and then it's it's also again in book nine, mm-hmm. where he says, uh, two fates bear on me the day of death. If I hold out here and lay, I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies." Correct. Yeah. No. I mean, and that is. I mean, I think that that's the central theme, right? It's I can I can have mortality by dying. Or I can I can have immortality by dying, or I can go home and live a long life and and be comfortable. And I think for a high school student to bring this back to what, the original point that I was trying to make, high school students don't have any grasp of what death is or what it's about. I mean, they, apart from you know, tragically those that have experienced great loss in their lives, right? Yeah. Um, mo- for the run the run of the mill high school student, I mean, I don't think they have the sufficient grounding to really experience what this text is all about. Yeah, I think mortality plays in it big. Um, on that point, too, there's an interesting reading that I found in the text where you can secularize the gods and their wills to be synonymous with the will of nature. Sure, yeah. So, like, for instance, when the gods are talking to the soldiers in the battlefield, it'll say, um, like, oh, did, um, I'm forgetting his name now, but it would say something like Nestor. Uh, heard the words of Athena and and knew or recognized that it was her voice. Yes. So, so whatever he's receiving isn't speech. In that. In that. Right. And right. Uh, or 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 I mean I think you know a good a really good example is right at the beginning in book one when when Achilles is in the middle of drawing his sword. Gosh, I wish I knew the line number of this because I would I would read it. But he's in the middle of drawing out his sword and Athena is you know, sped down from Olympus by Hera to stop him from pulling out his sword and slaying Achilles or in slaying Agamemnon because ultimately he needs to be, you know, kind of a bigger man and fight with words rather than, you know, killing, killing him outright with his sword. And, and you can really see, it's like, well, there's a way of reading it. And I think it's a very legitimate way of reading it, that the gods really are, are, are kind of just, you know, a, a maybe a, and I'm trying to say this in as humble way as I can, you know, they're kind of a, an explanation for that thing that happens to you when you're about to do something and all of a sudden you run up and you stop and you think for a second. It, there's something divine about that intervention, right? Like I was about to pull out my sword and, ki- and kill him and then I thought better of it. And there's something divine about that moment where I decide not to kill him. Or in, in this is, you know, kind of, on the flip side, you know, there's every hero, it seems at some point is, is, is given the epithet, a match for Aries, right? You know, what is Aries is rage. It's a possession of, of an emotion. You know, what happens when you're angry? That's what it means to be possessed by Aries, right? So what is Aries? I mean, he's in some sense, he's anger itself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, and I rather like that reading. Um, I don't think it's, it's a an exhaustive one, but I like it. No, 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 by no means is it exhaustive. And there's times in the story where the gods step over the line of um, just being synonymous with nature mm-hmm. and interact with the characters. Um, but I think one of the themes that goes along with mortality is this notion of fate. Yeah, and. Um, all of like none of the soldiers are certain of any outcomes in any battles, but 
they all under their relationship to the gods is their understanding of fate. And and further that. Yeah, and well, there's an interesting interplay, right? It's like Zeus, Zeus's will in some sense is synonymous to fate, and yet it seems that Zeus the character is, <laughs> as a character, is subject to fate as well, right? Um, I mean, I think there's an interesting discussion there, and I, and, and I think one that's particularly relevant to what we were just talking about, of what, what are the gods in terms of nature or something greater than nature. Yeah. You know, ult ultimately the... I almost want you know it's like it's it's almost like there there is a certain game that the gods play, and that game has rules, mm -hmm. um, and they're all players in that game. The rule, the rule is fate, but that ne doesn't necessarily mean that they're not free to play the game. They're free to play the game by the rules, which is that which is fated, right? Yeah. And in, within there, they can do whatever they want, and I think that that's why. Athena and Hera, and later on, we're going to see Poseidon enter the battle as well on the sides of the Greeks, even though clearly, at least for books one through 12, you know, it's the will of Zeus that the Greeks should get their asses handed to them in battle in order to glorify Achilles, interestingly enough. But, and also, it also gives glory to, he to Hector. And I think that that's one of the one of the reasons too that Achilles and Hector are, are foils in the way that they are. Yeah. It's very interesting the sense in which um, Zeus is favoring of Thetis, Achilles' mother, and her wish to see Achilles glorified. Mm -hmm. It outmuscles the will of all of the other gods and all of the soldiers in the battlefield. Right. So Zeus is sort of the ultimate will or the ultimate fate. Mm -hmm. But when matters don't go as high as to the the most powerful god, the wills of everyone else begin to matter. And so there's there's this interesting interplay there about what the most powerful will affects upon, and then what the other gods affect upon, and then what the men themselves affect upon in battle. So there's like different levels of fate that evolve in the text. Yeah, clearly. Clearly, because you know, in in some sense, these these human characters are the playthings of the gods, and yet, remarkably, they they actually do exert some kind of control over them as well, or at least they try to, and sometimes are successful. Right? Why does Thetis go to Zeus in the first place? Well, because Achilles asks him asks her to, right? Um, and I think. You know, the same can be said about at the very beginning, right? Apollo rains down plague upon the Greeks because Chryses was upset that Agamemnon had stolen his daughter and he offered ransom and he couldn't get her back. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it is interesting this. I mean, you, you almost, if you zoom out and kind of take a meta perspective on it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost as if to say that the supernatural powers that, that govern the world whatever they are, whether they're some kind of human emotion or something metaphysically higher, that we can bargain with them. Mm. And if we make the right sacrifices, we can get what we need or want out of them. Yeah. And there's also... And, yeah, go ahead. The number one shielding of against the misfortunes that fate plays upon the soldiers seems to be nobility mm -hmm. and that's like nobility in battle in character in honesty um i mean the, the whole reason that the greeks struggle in the first 12 books is because of agamemnon's wronging of achilles mm -hmm. of because, his honor yeah his lack of nobility uh, the fascinating thing too i find it it kills tens of thousands of people in the first 12 books. Yeah. Um, but when... Well, and isn't that a good warning? <laughs> don't, yeah. don't seek glory that's beyond your position because tens of thousands of people might die as a result. Yeah. And as, 
that that goes along with what we've been saying about fate. Um, there's no character that acts rightly in the book or courageously or honorably that fate frowns upon. Right. At any point. Well, okay. So with that, I wanna I wanna I wanna zoom in on uh, on a passage in book four. And ultimately, I'm setting the stage for a discussion of book six that I think directly relates to that point. And that's the interplay between fate and honor and ultimately what I would claim is Homer's critique of heroic values. Um, so I, I want to start with a quotation that, you know, really... Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit off the wall here. Um, the first time I read the Iliad through cover to cover, it was clear to me that the author had not only a love for the Trojans, but clearly prefers them mm. to, to the Greeks. And it's like, well, that's odd. I mean, this, this book is written in Greek, but it's, if you read it in English translation and you didn't know that it was written in Greek, you might question whether or not it was written by a Trojan. Um, I think Particularly, I don't know if, if you're even familiar with the end of the story, Max, and I don't want to spoil it, but especially given the ending, it's uh, this this book could clearly have been written by by a Trojan. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I mean, there's a there's a lot that could be said about that, but ultimately, what the the point that I am trying to make is that um, the Greeks are far more human. The the Greeks are far less human than the Trojans. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that this particularly is true, um, based on their interactions with Zeus, who's like the King God. It's like all of these other divinities, no matter how much they're, how, how important they are, it's, it's ultimately Zeus who gets the final say in everything. And I, and I want to, I want to quote Zeus, um, from book four and he's speaking to Hera. It's basically, you know, Hera's pissed and she wants, she wants these Trojans dead and we'll do anything to get it. And, and Zeus ultimately succumbs to Hera's will for some reason or another. And, but this is what he says. He says, now I'm willing to yield to you, though with an unwilling heart. Since all of the cities beneath the sun and starry heavens, in which men bred on earth maintain their dwellings, sacred Ilion, Troy, has ever been most honored in my heart, and Priam, Lord of the fine ash spear and Priam's people. For never yet has my altar lacked its share of the feasting, neither libations nor savor, the honor that's due to us. Why does Zeus love the Trojans? Because they sacrifice to the omnipotent power that is in the proper way all the time without fail. Mm -hmm. And the Greeks don't, right? Yeah, the Greeks have a very, seemingly have a very different relationship with the gods. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I want to take that. I mean, it's like, well, geez, like why? One, it's like Zeus is arbitrary, right? It's like you're, you're telling me of all the people in the entire world that worship you, the, tro the Trojans do it the best and you're about to let them get killed because Hera's being, you know, because Hera's being Hera. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I don't know what to make of that. You know, there's, there is the tradition ultimately that Rome was founded by Aeneas, right? Who's a character we've seen a few times in the, in books one through 12. You know, basically after the sack of Rome, he or after the sack of Troy, he gets the hell out of Dodge and ends up founding the city of Rome, which, you know, however many hundreds years later ends up conquering not only Greece, but the entire Mediterranean basin. And it's like, yeah, fuck you guys. That's what you get for sacking Troy <laughs> in, in 1200 BC. We're, we're conquering the Mediterranean basin. Um, and, you know, like there's something there's something kind of appealing about that reading. That, yeah, that Troy, Troy was meant to live, and the fact that it falls is tragic in this story, and it's sad for these people. But they're the ones that are ultimately the ones we need to look up to in this story because they seem to be the only ones that act with any kind of inkling of sense. Yeah, and that's why 
Troy's protection and putting up with Paris is so strange. Mm -hmm. um, because he's he's kind of a coward. And yeah. he he causes the conflict and then is totally apathetic towards it. Yeah. And so what do you make of I mean, gosh, this is perfect for you know what I wanted to talk about with book six, but what do you make of of Hector's treatment of Paris? Because you know, it's clearly Hector's mad at him for not espousing the heroic virtues that he does, right? Hector is the hero par excellence. I think he beats out every person in the book for being the best hero. And then and yet he still exhibits this 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 love for his brother and, and ultimately challenges him throughout book six, especially, you know, at the beginning or at the end of book five and the beginning of book six, challenges him to, you know, kind of get his act together and get his ass back out on the battlefield, right? Mm -hmm. Um and and the other unique thing about Hector is it seems that he's the only person other than Achilles, really. It's like Achilles and 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 Briseis and Hector and Andromache are the only four characters in the book who exhibit, you know, ro any kind of romantic love, any kind of deep love with one another. And you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, what do you make of of the scene where Hector goes back into the city and he, you know, finds Andromache and. I found his treatment of Paris to be unbelievably soft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he, he lost to, um, or it was a Diomedes. Or to Menelaus. Menelaus, yeah, in between yeah. the armies. Mm -hmm. um, then he's saved by a god. Aphrodite, yeah. And then doesn't return to battle until... Many, many more things have happened, and many more people have died. And Hector comes in and chastises him rather softly. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Especially if we give if we give Hector the title of the most heroic guy in the book. I I honestly was dumbstruck by it, mm. um, because it seems to me that the lack of virtue of Agamemnon at times is mirrored by Paris. And I see an Agamemnon-Paris dichotomy. Yeah. Um, and then Hector is dichotomized by Achilles. Mm -hmm. uh, but Hector is the far more noble one. But I, I mean, I don't know the pre-story before the war, but since Paris caused the war, it's it's amazing that so many thousands are dying and um, you know slipping into death and the book goes into grotesque details and yet he's sleeping with his wife away from the battlefield after losing during a truce mm -hmm. breaking the truce so I yeah. guess my question is what's so special about Paris yeah well I mean, let's think, so, so the backstory, I mean, I guess that is kind of, let, let's talk about that a little bit, right? So, so the reason the war starts is ultimately the goddess Strife, you know, being Strife, wanted to cause some trouble, and she created a golden apple, and she, at the wedding party of Thetis and Peleus, so Achilles' parents, at that wedding, Strife basically presents this apple to Zeus, this golden apple, and says, give this to the most beautiful goddess. Mm. And Zeus, being the wise, omnipotent guy that he was, wanted nothing to do with that. <laughs> you know, of course I'm not going to have to choose between my wife and daughters, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to step away from this. I'm not going to do it, deal with this. And so Strife throws the apple into the world where it lands basically at the feet of Paris. And so Paris gets to choose between Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. 
who is the most beautiful. And ultimately they, they promise him various gifts in exchange for choosing her. And he chooses Aphrodite and the gift that Aphrodite gave her him was um, the hand of the most beautiful woman in the world in marriage. Mm. And then basically right after that, Troy and Sparta um, become allies and they send Hector and Paris to Sparta as, you know, kind of, what would you call them? Ambassadors or diplomats or whatever to solidify this, this treaty in, um, you know, in official terms. And basically Sparta is where Helen was the queen of and wife of King Menelaus. And well, we know how that ends, right? Um, and he takes her back with him along with a whole bunch of her gold and wealth um, to Troy with him so yeah so i mean what do you make of paris it's like is it really his fault and what does that mean it's like well what does aphrodite mean like what is she mm -hmm. you know because i mean she is by no means what what i think you know a modern western particularly man would want to imagine from her, right? She is both, you know, like to, to use the word sexy to describe her is so far from the truth <laughs> that, you know, it, it's just annoying that you could possibly even say that it's like, she is in some sense beauty itself, but she's also kind of both sides of beauty. There's like the kind of dark and, mischievous or attractive you know lusty lust lust i would say but then at the other hand on the other hand she is seemingly wholesome innocent i mean she basically encap encapsulates everything that is both good and bad about desire mm. um sort of in her person you know and, and maybe that's um maybe i mean maybe there's something to take away from that it's it's Paris happens to be beautiful, maybe the most beautiful of all of the Trojans, and he ends up getting the most beautiful woman in the world, probably because of his looks is, you know, maybe the moral of the story. And maybe he, maybe he did a wrong thing. You know, maybe it's an injunction to, you know, just like Agamemnon, don't, don't exceed your glory lest you kill a bunch of people. Maybe it's also keep it in your pants lest you kill a bunch of people. Yeah, you know, it, it 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 really is amazing. Some of the moral injunctions that the book makes, and not by means of dictate, but it just says, "Hey, look, this is what happens when you do these things." And, yeah. if, and if these are the results you want. Like, fine, go ahead with it, but they don't seem to me all all that desirable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it was that was something I mentioned earlier that um, when a character acts nobly fate seems to go his way mm -hmm. but when yeah. characters act without virtue um there horrible things happen to their armies or they mm -hmm. die i i find i still find even given the backstory um the very uh hesitant chastisement of paris by hector to be interesting <laughs> And I find it, I find the backstory very interesting because strife is ultimately what caused this chain of events, right? Um, and it's very interesting that the war starts in a comparison of beauty. And I think we see this with a lot of the themes in the text. You go from these very strange and some might call petty concerns down to very heroic and noble concerns mm -hmm. and fate weaves that process back and forth where the entire war is being fought for one man's wife so you could say that it's a bit petty especially since agamemnon has so many kingdoms and so much wealth but then within the story you find moments of like immense courage and bravery um and nobility and honesty and fearlessness 
So I find, um, for instance, like the trivializing element of the story that comes from Paris's cowardice to be replaced by Hector's nobility. And I think you see that pattern over and over again. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, so on that, on that train of thought, you know, if, if I told you that one of Homer's theses was that these heroic values are overrated and maybe we should get rid of them. Mm. Would you, I mean, would you agree with that kind of, just based on the, the analysis you were just giving? I mean, ultimately it's, this is, these are, this is, you know, acts of greatness, quote unquote, in response to something so stupid and petty. Yeah. You know, no, it's like, so, I mean, the, like the quote unquote greatness is predicated upon something that's not great. Yeah. And there are, there are moments in the text that sound like descriptions of the trenches in World War I hmm. that are just horrific depictions of battle. You know, like thousands of people laying dead, like rivers of blood. Um, and then like there's hundreds of descriptions in the book of a spear entering someone's face or chest or something. Yeah. So Homer seems to be critiquing the realities of war in a very objective way. Because like you said, he's never stating this thesis. Right. Um, it's, a, it's esoteric. But no honest reader can say that um, the text is actually for the motivations and the violence that follows from it that unfolds. Yeah, I mean, it's almost, it's, it's almost as if, you know, mu much like, much like, I mean, I, I've never been to war, so I can't really speak all too authoritatively, but it, it, it seems in some sense that Homer writes in the same way that, you know, maybe an 18 year old or 19 year old draftee might respond to the war. It's like, well, I didn't start this thing. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm not, I don't belong here. Maybe this thing is all wrong anyway, but like I've got a job to do. And ultimately if I don't do a good job, I am going to die. Yeah. You know, and so it doesn't at all trivialize the men who find themselves there fighting these battles. And yet it also critiques the values, quote unquote, the heroic values or the heroic code that in some sense keeps the war going on and on and on. It's like if, if I mean, they broke the truce, right? It's like Menelaus cl clearly won the battle because Aphrodite sp springs in and steals Paris away and saves him. So Menelaus clearly wins. And they swore a pact to, if Menelaus wins, give Helen back and give her him the treasure and give them just recompense for the fact that they've been fighting in front of Troy for nine years and be done with it, right? Mm -hmm. But, and I don't know what to make of that because, I mean, ultimately it's the gods who choose to keep the war going. Yeah. In that scene. I, I don't remember if it's Apollo. I think it might even be Apollo basically goes to an archer and says, hey, how much glory? Yeah, I mean, that's what that's the argument he says. He says, how much glory would you win if you killed Menelaus right now? <laughs> that's literally the argument that Apollo makes to this guy. And, and you know, let's, let's just dial that back. It's, that's that noble, orderly, triumphant side, deep, you know, voice within you. I could be. I could go down in history forever as the man who killed Menelaus and ended this battle by shooting by firing off this arrow right now. Yeah. Which, by the way, in the heroic code, bows and arrows are not at all respected because it's not real warfare. So, yeah. how interesting is that, right? It's like I could win great honor for myself by using a dishonorable instrument of war and breaking this truce, and it, it's that's interesting. Yeah. And there's the that's that voice of fate that we were previously talking about um some people are able to recognize that the gods are speaking to them but they're unable to make appropriate actions afterwards so they either follow it blindly um and misfortune happens like in the case of the archer mm -hmm. or fate gives them good advice 
So there's almost this sense where fate is either encouraging these petty appetites or the virtues of a character, but the characters themselves don't know at the time when they hear the voice of the gods whether or not they're being instructed to do something noble or not. Mm. And so it seems like the the characters who are played with by the gods um, where the playing with ends in misfortune or more bloodshed um, are the types of characters who are unwilling to question the voice of the gods in some way. Mm. What, 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 what is your take maybe besides, I don't know if we fully resolved your point about Hector's seemingly lack of, you know, lack of lack of harsh critique and i just want to quote really quickly the very end of book six this is what hector says to paris look no one in his right mind would choose to disparage your work in battle your courage is not in question but clearly paris's courage is in question like he shrinks from menelaus at the beginning of book three and has to only goes into battle because hector encourages him to Mm -hmm. um I mean, what do you make of that? Because the, and, and, and how do you make of that in light of where that scene follows? You know, it's like that, that, it's almost like it's a noble lie that Hector tells to Paris to motivate him to go, go in and fight. And, you know, this happens right after Hector basically embraces his fate in a conversation with his wife, you know, and says, you know, my sad wife, don't grieve at heart for much, for me over much. No man shall send me to Hades before my fated day. Though that day, I must tell you, no man has ever escaped, be he coward or hero, mm. when once he's born to this world. Go back to the house now, attend to your proper tasks, the loom and the distaff. Give your handmaids their orders, set them to work, but warfare shall be the business of men, all those, and myself above all, who are native to Ilion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it, it, and, and, and I, I, I mean, I wish I could just read, it, read out the entire scene of Hector with Andromache, but (laughs) he is so in love with her and she is so in love with him. And he is so in love with their baby son. And yet he, you know, basically prophesies like, Hey, listen, we're, we're going to lose this war and there's no way I'm going to let myself be alive to hear your screams as some Greek drags you off to be his wife. Yeah. And there's no way I'm going to be alive to see my son thrown from the ramparts of Troy, which ends up happening, by the way. You know, it's... The juxtaposition of those two characters is striking, too. Like, Hector is, in a sense, the protagonist of the book. Yeah, clearly. Exactly. No, sure. Absolutely. And Paris, the actual cause of everything Hector has to do is he's ridiculous mm-hmm. in what he does. I mean, the, in the Fagel's translation, he says, when he walks up to Paris in book six, he says, what on earth are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as if like one of the greatest fighters in Troy shouldn't know that if he causes a war, he should be on the battlefield. Right. I I think Hector is a very Kantian character in a way. Oh, say more. He's he's always doing the best for his army and his people. And that's what motivates him. He's duty bound. Yeah. He's Pious. both both his mom and his wife request that he not go back to battle. And he denies them both. Mm-hmm. He, he said, like, what would the men down there do without me in both cases? Yeah. Um, and you, you don't see a similarly flawless motive on the Greek side. Yeah, uh, I mean, and it's not that Hector doesn't make mistakes. You know, no. it's that he's duty-bound. Yeah, his motivations are... His motivations are always above himself, it seems. So I guess, you know, the a good question then reflecting on the character of Hector. You know, if if the world had more Hectors in it, would it be a better place or would it be a worse place? Mm. 
because I, clear, because clearly there's there's vice in following duty to its to its final end all the time. Yeah. And he does leave his wife a widow and his son dead in the end. Yeah. It's curious. I think, in a way, Hector is blinded by his duty. Hmm. Because of his inability to end the war as the leader of the Trojans. I mean, not the ultimate leader. Uh, there's his dad. But as the leader of the Trojans in battle, um, I think the Greeks have many more conversations about, like, Agamemnon, you're being stupid. Like, give Achilles back his girl. Or um, many more of the people speak out against the Greek leader than they do against Hector. Well, there's nothing to speak out against. Yeah. It's like the man's blameless. But his blamelessness is also the root of his demise. Mm -hmm. Like him being so light with, um, with Paris is ultimately what leads to his demise. And I, I just find it so interesting from the Trojan perspective that more pressure in the first 12 books isn't put on Paris to return Hera and um, so the Greeks will leave Troy alone. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's not for the, I mean, Antenor, who is, you know, the, basically it seems that in, among the old men, he's second to Priam. And he says, you know, very clearly in book three, like, man, she's beautiful, but I really wish we could give her back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he says that. Um, yeah. But what a hesitant comment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's that. I, I think I, I think I posed it more hesitantly than than Antenor does. But, um, it's like everybody really knows what the right thing to do. Gosh, okay. How about yeah? I mean, it's like the Trojans know what the right course of action is, mm -hmm. but they're ultimately unwilling. I actually. To for for the sake, I mean, but for the sake of what? Why protect Paris? I mean, I mean, like this question actually arose in my head: uh, what the name Paris means, mm. and why it was made to be a city in France. Okay, I'm not sure that they're etymologically related, but go that ahead. Be different. No, that's what I, that's what I was wondering. Because I was reading, and I, you know, kind of have a contempt for Paris. Mm -hmm throughout the first 12 books. And I was wondering what he represented um, and if that had any link to the city of Paris. Yeah, no, unfortunately there is not. So almost exclusively actually in the Greek, um, Paris is Alexandros, mm. which is something else that's interesting, by the way. His name is Ale Alexander, Alexandros. Um, and it's only his basically his other name is Paris that he's referred to here and there, but we've in cult in, in our common culture come to know him as Paris. So Fagels in particular only refers to him as Paris, where the translation that I'm reading does refer to it refers to him in, as Alexandros when he's Alexandros and Paris when he's Paris. Um, and the the name of Paris the city actually comes from the Germanic tribe that was living there way back in the day. But so there's not actually a connection there, but it is interesting um, because that you know it's like you, you, synonyms of different source sources don't don't come <laughs> don't come without some kind of association. Yeah, yeah. You know? But yeah, I I don't I don't reading the first twelve books. I have no idea why the Trojans stick with Paris. I mean, what what do you think is a good analogy for what's going on? I mean, imagine Troy as a as a person hmm. is, and and he's a good person. Clearly, it's it's sort of like a person um, has a diamond ring, and 
he's willing to do everything and anything for this diamond ring at the expense of tens of thousands of lives. Mm. Rather than cast the ring away, you know? Yeah, I mean, I wonder, though, and, I mean, ultimately, yeah, we're reasoning from an, from an, an analogy, so maybe we're straying far from what Homer was trying to communicate to us. But I wonder, you know, what if, what if Helen is the pearl of great price that we're supposed to sell everything and buy? You know, or the field that has a treasure buried in it, and so I went and sold all of my things to buy that field. Yeah. But you know, I, think, it's, I think Homer's aware of this. Um, at the end of one of the battle scenes, um, uh, in the Fagel's translation, it says, you could hear some Trojan or Greek pleading, Father Zeus ruling over us all from Ida, God of greatness and glory, whoever brought this war on both our countries, let him rot and sink to the house of death, but let our packs of friendship all hold fast. Mm. And that's in, that's in book three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no, you're right. So, I mean, so you're definitely right. Your interpretation stands over mine, clearly. Well, the soldiers themselves realize that this, like, the, the reasons for war are maddening compared to their experience. Right. Like, their experience of war is so horrific that... Um, they themselves question the motivations for it. And I think, like, one of Homer's messages is about the suffering of the soldiers. And I think... Say, say that again for me. Um, that one of the things he Homer brings up, one of the main themes is the suffering of the soldiers, what they have to... Oh, yeah. And I think he's very aware of the costs of war. And part of what the text begs is... What is worth war? Clearly not the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> Clearly not. At least not for the Trojan. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's really hard. And, and we haven't read the whole book yet, but it's really hard for me to read this whole book as, as an epic, rightfully speaking. You know, it's, it's clearly a tragedy. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's clearly Hector's tragedy. And even the structure of the narrative bears that out, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think the other... And, and I, just, I just don't know what to make of the stature that Troy holds within the heart and the eye of Zeus. I don't know what to make of that combined with its, the fact that it's destroyed and the fact that they were had so much going for them, except for they made one mistake and they wouldn't get over it. Yeah. But you know, but then you zoom out at the whole mythological narrative, and guess what? Troy does win because they found Rome. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I I really I don't know. I don't know. I I. It's not clear that that is just a tale that's invented in the first century A.D. It's it's m more than likely that there was mythological rooting to that before the Aeneid was penned by Virgil in the first century. So I mean I don't know I don't know how I don't know if it goes all the way back to Homer and and the oral traditions of the bards that are singing these songs that Troy ultimately will come back and crush the Greek. Um, I mean I guess I could do research on that, but I don't I don't think there's any way of proving that that's true. Yeah. But I just don't know what to make. Okay, so I mean, let's ignore it for a moment. So say, so say the. What does the Greek? What is it? What is an Athenian? You know, in fifth century Athens BC. What What's the moral of this story for him? And you know, maybe we could read the commentators, and maybe they're right, and maybe they're wrong. But that's the. It's a very interesting thing about Homer's writing style, though, too. There is no clear message in the Iliad. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. all put on the reader. Right. There's just speeches and the reporting of events. And the reporting of events in a very metaphysical way. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the, so I don't, it's almost as if it's um, a story without a moral. And I feel like it's moral is something that could be found again and again in each generation. Right. I mean, that's what makes it timeless, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, but I mean, gosh, you gotta, you, I mean, you see why that's unsatisfying to me, right? Yeah, I do. I, yeah, I mean, there's, there, I mean, it, it, okay, well, I, l let's shift gears. I mean, I think we could probably go down a rabbit, rabbit hole here that maybe wouldn't re ever resolve. So maybe we should kind of pivot the conversation a little bit. Um, I was, um, I was wondering if I could bring Machiavelli in real quick on uh, fate. Yeah, no, by all means. This was one of the most gripping and distasteful passages I read in my undergraduate studies. Um, but I, I feel like it's very true of the events in the Iliad. Um, Machiavelli writes in The Prince, that I judge this indeed that it is better to be impetus than cautious, because fortune is a woman, and it is necessary if one wants to hold her down, to beat her, and to strike her down. And one sees that she lets herself be won more by the impetus than those who proceed coldly. And so always like a woman, she is a friend of the young, because they are less cautious, more ferocious, and command her with more audacity. Um, that's wow. a, it's a, it, Dr. Quinn draws Machiavelli at the heart of modernism, but the Greeks find themselves, um, in the text beholden to all of fortune. And Machiavelli is the first writer in the Western tradition that says, no, actually fortune is in our hands and basically describes a rape of fortune by any means necessary to maintain one's state. So I find that very interesting, the idea that comes through the Iliad of everything being beholden to fortune to everything being beholden to men. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we just got resentful and bitter at the arbitrariness of it. <laughs> I mean, I, and I don't mean to like literally rip off exactly like Jordan Peterson's message about life, but... Clearly, there, that's a difference between modern man and these Greeks. Right? Uh, I mean, it's the ones, that, the ones that... Gosh, I mean, it's just remarkable how... It's like even, even Achilles isn't resentful and bitter. Because when the two heralds come to collect Briseis, it's like, yeah, it's not your fault. It's Agamemnon's. Go ahead and take her. And my quarrel's not with you guys. Yeah. You know? It's like... That, I mean, that's, that's amazing. I mean, their response to, to tragedy, to suffering, to being slighted and dishonored is, it's just not the way that we would do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not at all clear to me that, that we are doing it better than they do. Yeah. I mean, at least, at least what I would call the heroes in this story. You know, it's like Achilles does it, does it right. Hector does it right. I mean, talk about Hector. I mean, he's given a bad situation, and what is his response to it? It's, I'm going to do what my job is, and you know what? I'm going to fight these guys all the way back to their ships, and I'm going to try and burn them and slaughter them all on this beach, even though I know I'm going to lose in the end. Yeah. I was actually going to ask you, um, when this book was being recited orally, was it the primary oral recitation um, or is it the only one left among many? You mean the text of the Iliad itself? Yeah. I mean, so obviously this is what they call in Homeric studies, the Homeric question, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and there are a lot of different uh, opinions. I am only going to tell you the one I subscribe to because I think it's the one that's right. Um, ultimately, whatever the Trojan War was happened in about 
1200 BC. You know, there's a, there's evidence in Troy seven that some battle took place um, there. Um, the Iliad, as we know, it is not written down until about 750, 700 BC. So that's about 500 years of of oral tradition and passing things on. Um, I I think that it, it is clear to me that the Iliad is not a cobbling of various oral traditions written down and put together in a single volume. It's clear to me that that's not what the Iliad is. It's also clear to me that whoever did write down the version of the poem that he did, that he did was in fact a bard that contained, you know, kind of the pre-literate mind. Hmm. Because even even in his ability to, or, or he's just really insightful, right? Because he he sees in the pre-literate, you know, kind of idiosyncrasies of oral poetry. He leaves them in, but he's clearly editing other things right and left, you know, to make a coherent story, to make it twenty-four. I mean, he didn't actually divide it into books, but to more or less put the climax absolutely in the middle with foreshadowing in what becomes book 11 that gets mirrored in book 14. Like it's the structure of the narrative is clearly one that has to be, you, you know, you have to like put pen to paper to you, I think to do what he's doing, but he also kind of respects some of the idiosyncrasies of, of oral poetry. Like for example, Priam doesn't know who these enemies are and it's the ninth year of the Trojan war. And he's asking Helen, Hey, who's that guy? He looks strong. <laughs> you know, you know. Um, so, so I, so I am of the opinion that that Homer is the author of the Iliad, and he was a bard who learned of these traditions and these stories and recited them, and you know, frankly, like made it his own. You know, he inherited the tradition, and then he passed on. A, a tradition. So there's clearly, I think there's clearly the genius of one author. And anyway, that's happening at about, you know, 750, 700 BC. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is a good, it, it, I think that it is the one that survives because it is one, probably the most true of the oral traditions themselves, like the morals of the story. But then he also just does something that maybe uh, an, anonymous or national poetry couldn't and that was really stir the soul of an individual apart from any nation or country um, ultimately there were stories a whole bunch of them that were being told in this in this particular meter dactylic hexameter and being sung up and all up and down the countryside and by historical accident of the ones that were written down only the iliad and the odyssey survive because so that, that's a super long answer to your question. I'm sorry. No, it was very insightful. One of the things I was trying to do while reading it, which I know I'm not allowed to do, is I was trying to picture me thousands of years ago sitting around a campfire at night, drinking wine, mm. listening to this as the only source of media or narrative or anything else in my society. Like it, it's, what was that like? What was that exercise like? Yeah. Well, what were the people listening to this? How did they understand their place in the cosmos and their lives in terms of this story? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's very, I, that's why I was wondering what the primacy of this story might have been in their culture and in their life. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a hard one to answer, but because you know, there's... I mean, it, but it, but just think about it for a moment. This thing, this this book, is two thousand seven hundred and fifty years old. That shit doesn't survive by accident, you know. Yeah, like there were humans all along the way who had to copy it and to 
read old copies of it that were deteriorating and recopy them, you know, and basically do that every 25 to 50 years. Mm. You know, it's, it's the fact that any, the fact that any of these stories make it, you know, I'm in, you know, kind of go along with the archaic stories in Genesis, you know, like Genesis one through 11 and the stories of the Iliad, you know, some of the epics that come out of Mesopotamia, the Enuma Elish and whatever. Mm -hmm. It is a sheer miracle that we still have them. And, and you got, I mean, gosh, it's a miracle that they survived and they're so old that, and they're so old and their stories that are so good that we're still telling them. And we kept telling them all the way through the process. They must speak something that is just so true to everyone who hears them or else what's the point you know um I, I i hope by the end of our of our reading of the great books of western t tradition you know we will really learn that and and you know not to you know steal ideas from Gautamer and, and truth and method but you know i hope that we will learn that the tradition is the fullest and most authentic expression of human freedom Mm -hmm. that there is because the traditions don't hand on themselves, right? They're given to a certain group of people who willfully and freely choose to pass them on to the next generation, you know? And so that means that a tradition that is ancient has stirred the hearts and the minds of free individuals for centuries. And we would do well to, you know, grant a vote to to our ancestors who have gone by you know mm. um I, I couldn't agree more i think uh maybe a, a good way to end or maybe second to end topic sure. uh, is to ask you what what some of the lessons you drew from the first 12 books were hmm. yeah about, about living well or living differently and I could even start it off if you want me yeah, to. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Um, I don't know if this has existed in any other society, um, or it was an accurate representation of a society, but their paragraph-length speeches, uh, described as speeches which the spirit arouses you to speak, <laughs> yeah. um, and their councils especially, when they all gather around and discuss what they're going to do next, they're amazing speeches. The rhetoric and the imagery and the recollection of history um, that's just packed into these paragraph long speeches is incredible. And I, when I was reading it, I noticed how different the length and style of speech was from contemporary speech. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, just how often in conversation we'll, we'll say, you know, two or three sentences, and then the other person will speak, and then, you know, back and forth in that way. Um, and the way in which their speech to their allies is always ennobling to the other people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, isn't it, isn't, there's, there's something interesting about that, right? It's like, you know, and they set aside desire for food and drink, and then they entered, engaged in conversation. And yeah, the speeches, I mean, it, I don't, I don't claim to know that they sat and ate in silence, but I, 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 imagine if they did. Yeah. It's, it, the, the way that it, it's written, it seems that no one speaks during the meal and only after they uh, eat and drink until their heart's content mm -hmm. does anyone speak. It's almost as if their words are so important in uh the culture of the men who are doing battle that it would be like dishonorable or it would be rude to speak while distracted by food or drink. Right. No, clearly, no, clearly I, there is something very sacred about the spoken word in the Iliad and, you know, kind of what's the, what's the meta, the meta narrative, you know, this is a spoken oral sung poem. You know, so listen, damn it. <laughs> listen to what I'm saying to you because these lessons are important. Yeah. And I love, 
I love how everyone in the story, in the speeches, has a place in history. Yeah. they will be like, they'll name a person's name and then son of this person who conquered this land. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's everyone in the story has a place in history that I think is completely alien from the modern world. Yeah. The contemporary world. Where, like, if anyone were to refer to me in conversation, it wouldn't be Max, son of Donald. Right, right. And this or this, um, who comes from these places and has accomplished these things. It would just be Max. Yeah, this is Max, my friend. And so, I, I might say that we went to school together, I might not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something I think we could learn from the text is one, to speak when the spirit guides you and say everything that you have to say. Um, but the other thing is to recognize the story and humanity of the person that you're speaking to when you speak. Yeah. Um, Cause it, it's constantly in contact with the, the other people's personal histories. And I think the other thing is everything in every speech quote in the book is rhetoric there's almost no declarative speech they're right. always trying to convince someone else of something that's interest that's an interesting observation i think it's right and that's it, it sort of places all of the onus on action in a way where the only time we really speak isn't to tell jokes or isn't to describe something um, or isn't to gossip, but it's to convince the other person to make the right choice. Right. Um, so that was, that was the one thing that struck me in the text. And I'll probably have more nuanced thoughts on the speech in the book as we finish the text, but I think we could learn a lot from speaking at greater length with other people and also doing so without distractions, like yeah. food and wine example. Clearly. Authors. Uh, uh, I, 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 I've got something I would like to say as, as a good lesson. Um, there's, there's, two in, there's two scenes in the book that seem to kind of it's a contradiction and it happened and, it, and it's in book four. Um, Diomedes and I forget who he's standing with, but Agamemnon comes up and basically rebukes them and says, you know, by far are you lesser than your fathers because you're standing around, <laughs> you know, and not, and not getting ready for battle. And Diomedes you know, comrade that he's standing with says, no, we are better men by far than our fathers for it was us who were, you know, we were the seven who sacked Thebes and, and all these things and basically lists why, you know, we're better than our fathers. And Diomedes basically says, yo, this sit down and shut up. That was a good correction. You know, no man is better than his father. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lesson in there. Um, for for young people and it's and it's and it's a there's a hubris and a pride that even especially recently that i've been under kind of under the spell of is that you know it's like i'm a millennial millennials want to do things differently particularly you know in life and in the business world and um you know it's time for you boomers to move over and let us make decisions because we've got something valuable to offer mm -hmm. and while i don't think that that's wrong i do think that it needs to be tempered with but hey by the way you guys actually did a really good job founding this company and have put it into a really great spot both financially and with great customers and with great technology you know what i mean so it's yeah. there's a need to temper your own thoughts about reality with the things that others have made into reality particularly those who are older than you Mm -hmm. And yeah. I want to kind of contrast that. I mean, I think that that's a lesson for, you know, maybe young men 
particularly those just starting out in the beginning part of their careers, you know, just like the two of us. I think that that's good advice. And I think that the flip side advice is, is Hector in book six, you know, hold, looking at his baby son, you know, basically says to him, you know, you know, if you should live, you know, may it be that you are known as a far better man than your father. Hmm. Those are opposite pieces of, I actually, right? It's. I think uh, that that gives some answer to the conundrum. Just a quick aside here with Paris. Mm. Um, I think Hector, in a way, knows that what his defense of Paris is wrong, in a way. Oh, interesting. And maybe that's the source or the motivation for that comment. Yeah, interesting. I because in a way it says that he thinks that what he's doing in preserving Troy is not the noblest of things to do. Right. Um, but I actually think that on your lesson, there's, there's an even deeper thing, which is when you're growing up, you don't ever realize the sacrifices that were made for your growing up. Mm -hmm. And realize them. Clearly. Um, yeah. But I, the the hours and hours of work and the waking up to crying babies, right. the building of a career, the, all of the things our parents do for us. But then I think that culminates at the gift of existence. Right. It, it is only because of our fathers that we are able to have a choice between anything in the first place. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately it's, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, I'm, I'm really grappling with this, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm engaged to be married and <laughs> I'm foreseeably, I foreseeably could have children within a year, not a year, a year and a half or two years. Um, be slow. <laughs> I, I know, but I'm presumably that could happen. And, and, you know, I, I, I can't help but imagine that my prayer is also going to be that my children be far greater than me, far better than I. Mm. You know, of course that's what I would want. But I think that the, 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 it's not actually a contradiction between... Oh, no, 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 exactly. No, it's a beautiful... It's a, it's, one is an advice for young people, the other is an advice for... Or one is the advice for children, the other is an advice for fathers. Yeah. Live in such a way that you make your children better than you as a father and as a son. Live in such a way that you are never forgetful or mm -hmm. ungrateful of the things that have been done to you. Those two piece of it, pieces of advice go hand in hand. Yeah. And that it's that were you to surpass your father you would never realize it at that moment because yeah. the very surpassing of what your father has done was because of your father. Clearly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. There's a humility there that in doing it, you would never recognize it in a way. Right. In, in, in so far as you did it, you would actually deny that you had done it because that's what it would mean. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I ultimately think that this book in particular, I mean, the reason that you and I, and, and sure, maybe we're more moral thinkers than, than some, maybe that's just a fact of studying philosophy and reading literature is finding, you know, moral injunctions, but... And doing ethics bowl for two years. Yeah, it could, could be that, you know, but I, I think that there is something unique about this text that speaks, you know, rules for life. Um, yeah. And, you know, may, maybe my, my final thought on the first half of our discussion, right, because, you know, we'll discuss, you know, the book as a whole next time. Um, maybe my, my, final, my final comment is that I, I think that this book is very fittingly the first real book of the Western intellectual tradition. Um, I can imagine, you know, people's listening to this 
listening to these stories and, and learning from them and trying to enact them out in their lives and having that really influence and affect the way that they thought, mm. you know, and especially when, you know, they started to, when the Iliad appears as, as a written work, I mean, how do you write something that, I mean, how do you attempt to, to write anything when when such a strong foundation has been written it's like you mm-hmm. want to you want to try to write you know and like you know kind of surpass it in greatness but you can't because it's the the only reason you're writing anyway could be because of this book yeah you know and so there's something you know both intellectually and morally and and even spiritually you know the things that you and I were talking about about with what are the gods and what is what does it mean to have god's favor and what does it mean to, you know, honestly be a good church going Christian today? Like, I mean, I think that the, all of these things go along with one another and the Iliad sits there right at the center. Um, this is fittingly the first book in our 45 book or so <laughs> binge through, um, through the Western tradition. And I think that ultimately it, it's, it speaks the truth of the Western man's soul because it is the substance of the Western man's soul, right? And, yeah. and, and Achilles' quest for immortality, his fundamental decision between staying at Troy and being known forever or going home, living a long life and being forgotten, I think that that is the predicament in which Western man in particular finds himself, knowledge that he's going to die anyway, and he can either live in such a way that he'll be remembered forever or he can live comfortably and not amount to him very much. Yeah. And I think it's, since it is the first book, it's our first philosophical introduction to the existential crisis that comes about when one realizes that most of our lives are governed by fate. And finding the substance in oneself to grapple with a reality that's totally outside of one's control. Um, I think there's, there's a very uh, Eastern tendency to turn inward um, in things like meditation, for instance. And the Iliad's message is very different in that it's the call to turn outwards. Mm-hmm in spite of death and faith. Yeah. No, clearly. And, 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 that, and that, that, that was the point that I was, you know, kind of trying to drive home, it seems. And, and I'm no expert on this. And, you know, it's a gross oversimplification, but I think it works for the purposes of this example that Eastern religions in general is both, both Western and Eastern worlds accept that life is suffering. Mm. And the Eastern response to that is, okay, then I am going to, and, and, and I'm going to, it's not life is suffering. It's that to have a subjective experience is to suffer. Mm. And the Eastern response to that is, okay, then I, as the subject, am going to drift in, and fade away into the background and become part of the background because that's how I'm going to escape suffering. And I think the Western response is, I'm going to embrace the suffering and I'm going to launch into it head on and I'm going to suffer. Mm -hmm. And as a result, 2,700 years later, two young men about my age will be talking about me and learning from what I did in my life. (laughs) I think that's probably a beautiful way to wrap it up. (laughs) Perhaps so. Okay, great. Hey, um, with that, you know, thanks everybody for, for listening. Um, I, I hope, I mean, we're not, frankly, we're not doing this for you. <laughs> we're doing this for us. Um, but if we can, uh, you know, start some conversations, stimulate some thought, and ultimately if we can, you know, help sow the seeds of a movement that uh, returns us back to the great books of our, of our tradition and we can learn something in the process, um, I think that that would be a, a job well done. What, what do you say, Max? I, I would say so. And I, I only hope to improve from here. <laughs> me too. I, I hope to become smarter. I hope to learn stuff. And ultimately, I hope that these books will change me. 
<laughs> That's the goal. Great. All right. With that, uh, everyone, thanks. This is this is Doyle and Max, and we're signing off. Cheers. <laughs>